Hello and welcome to SIMA F2 Financial Management. We are covering now Chapter 3, which is about IS7, a Statement of Cash Flows. Now, most importantly, at this paper, at this level of your SIMA, you're studying the consolidated cash flow statement. And for that, you are you have to be conversant with what a cash flow is, which you learned about in SIMA F1, and also to be conversant with consolidation. Assuming you know both, we can talk about the consolidated cash flow. And if you go at page 22 of your chapter 3, so let's go chapter 3, page 22, you have here a few cases, we'll take them one by one, that we would like to draw your attention upon. So when we talk about statement of cash flow consolidated, we'll be looking at reconciliation of profit to operating cash flow, again in a consolidated environment, impact of purchase sale of a subsidiary. We'll look separately as a second case to impact of purchase sale of a subsidiary on a T account type of working so that you're getting the missing figure. Then we're going to look at cash paid to non-controlling interest. How do we determine that? These are elements that you could come across in a question and they would be specific to a cash flow consolidated and cash received from associates which again impacts your consolidated cash flow. Ultimately and I'm not going to mention much about it, but you have to be aware as any standard, you would have to have disclosures on acquisitions or disposals of any subsidiaries. So we're talking about four cases and we'll start with the very first one. Reconciliation of profit before tax to cash from operations. And there are a set of, you have here just in front of you, a set of adjustments and we are saying, look at EBIT, everybody knows, earnings before interest and tax, and cash flows, operating cash flows. And you're going to say, if this element, we pick up various elements, is present in one of them, but not present in the other, will definitely be an adjustment in the reconciliation. For instance, if you take depreciation, everybody knows depreciation is included in earnings before tax. However, depreciation is not a cash flow item, therefore depreciation must be in the reconciliation. How do we deal with that? Well, if you start from EBIT, and then what do you do? Depreciation was taken out from EBIT, now you're adding it up. So you're adding depreciation to EBIT, the first adjustment. What happens to impairment of goodwill in the year? Well, you would expect that to be in the consolidated earning before interest and tax, but is that affecting cash flow? No, impairment is an accounting measure. So would that affect the EBIT? Of course, it was a minus, now again it comes with a plus. <clears throat> If you look at the credit sale made but not paid in cash yet, of course, you'd argue any sale, whether it's credit or cash, is recorded in EBIT, but because it's credit sale, it doesn't affect cash flow, therefore, it has a, you have to make an adjustment in EBIT. So it was included in earnings before interest and tax. Now you want to take it out. So this time you have a minus. What about write down of inventory to receivable value? Well, this is a very much of an accounting adjustment, isn't it? When you apply S2 and you write off your inventory to a recoverable value. However, it's not really a cash flow movement. So if it is a write-off, it was a minus in the EBIT, now it comes with a plus to neutralize its effect. What about increase in tax payable? Is it in earnings before interest in tax? We are before, therefore it's not included, but affects operating cash flows, does it? Not really. So this case, it's a nice example to see where one item does not, um, does not have to be reconciled. Remember, we do a reconciliation from profit before tax to cash from operations. What about goods purchased on credit? Well, clearly, if you purchase on credit or on cash, you include it in earnings before tax, interest and tax. However, because it's credit, purchase is not impacting on the cash flow, operating cash flows. Therefore, it is an adjustment. So you purchased on credit, it's a minus in EBIT, but now what you want to make it, it's a plus. Increasing provision for warranty costs, is it included in EBIT? Yes, it is, but provisions has nothing to do with cash flow. So how do we adjust if we have an increase in provision? Is that good? Well, provision treated like a liability, any increase in liability is sort of good news, so it's a plus. 
So these are the signs of your adjustments to EBIT to get to the operating cash flow. All right, I hope that makes sense. And we'll just briefly mention the second, second point here. And the second point refers to the working capital component. Remember, in your statement of cash flows consolidated, you have the working capital component, right? So you have to look at movement in receivables, movements in payables, and movements in inventory. So if the financial statement is not consolidated, what were you doing with movement in inventory? You are taking the closing balance or the ending balance less, o less opening balance. Ending balance less opening balance, right? So what we are saying, for instance, if inventory at the start of the year was 100, but at the year end you have inventory of 200, this movement in inventory, is it a good news or bad news on your cash flow? An increase in inventory, that movement, the difference between those two is 100, and any increase in inventory is getting cash stuck in your inventory, so it's like an outflow of resources, it's, it's a minus. So you're doing the same thing if it's consolidated, but remember what you have to do in addition to the ending balance, less opening val balance, as per the statement of financial position, you always have to say minus, Remember this inventories pre-acquisition of the subsidiary. Why? Because everything pre-acquisition has not been in our control. So it's the same story for receivable. You do ending balance of your consolidated receivables, less opening balance of your consolidated receivables, minus all the receivables pre-acquisition of the subsidiary and the same story with payables take out the payables pre-acquisition of the subsidiary okay i hope this is fairly clear and to prove it we're going to quickly look at this example edgar co-purchased the subsidiary eco on 30th september x1 on that date, ECO had receivables in the statement of financial position of 1,200. ECO and its subsidiaries at the start of X1 had receivables of 9,800. And on 31st December, X1 had receivables of 11,450. So ECO... In other words, Edgar, sorry, Edgar Co. has the drawdown figure on the receivables, 9,800, and at the end of the period, it finishes with 11,450. However, Edgar purchased a subsidiary and on 30th September, and on that particular day, the receivables were... 1200 so what do you have to do normally if you ignore the acquisition you would say the movement in receivables equal 11450 less 9800 that's normal but because remember this figure here 11450 receivables of edgar include the receivables of edmund you want to take out the proportion that existed pre-acquisition so you're also going to take out the 1200 so this being said it's just you had it all here and they gave us the maths and it is 450 okay we'll stop here and we'll do a separate video for the next two items you will come across specifically on a consolidated cash flow statements until then you have covered basically what happens with the movement of working capital within a consolidated statement of cash flows, but also we looked at reconciling the profit, the EBIT, with the cash flow from operations. Well done and look forward to being in touch with you on the next video. Meanwhile, best of luck with your preparations. Good luck.